Radio Retropolis. Welcome to the Dragnet Radio Podcast here on Radio Retropolis. Tonight, Friday tracks down a rich man who continues to rob and kill people even after an 18-year stay in prison. This is called The Gentleman Bandit Part 1, also known as The Big Gent, from July 20th, 1950, here on Radio Retropolis. <laughs> story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to a robbery detail. A holdup has been committed in a neighboring city. A bystander is shot to death. Two others are wounded. The bandits are ruthless, well-armed. Your job? Get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 6th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Ed Walker. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from Calvary Cemetery. It was 11.45 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. No, it's all right. Joe, how'd the funeral go? Pretty good turnout. Sure, sorry, I couldn't make it. Well, one of us had to be in court. Yeah. A lot of the boys out there, huh? Yeah. Martin had a lot of friends. He was a good cop. You see his wife? Yeah. His wife took it hard again. Pretty hard, yeah. Are you about ready for lunch? You better make up the logbook first. Now we're a little behind. Yeah, all right. Hi, Stu. Ben, what's with you? Oh, same old thing. Say... What's the DR number on that job we handled yesterday? Huh? The grocery store thing? You know, we showed those mug shots to the victims. You remember the DR number on it? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it here. Uh, 374332. 332, thanks. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir? My name's Frank Cheney. Just been paroled from Folsom. Can you tell me where I registered? Yeah. I'll get one of the men from the rehabilitation detail. He'll take care of it. Okay, thanks. Excuse me, Ben. Oh, yeah. Bossberg. Johnny Bossberg. Yeah. Got a minute? Something for you here. I'll be right there. Did you contact the witnesses in this report here? Let me see. This one. What do you got, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. I took Hello care of it. Hello, Mr. Desk. Once the register's next time. Hmm. Okay. Excuse me, Romero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hi, you want to register? Yeah, my name's Frank Cheney. Okay. Address? 218 Belgrade. Belgrade. Where you been? Folsom. Got out Saturday. Okay, what's the fall for? Robbery, first degree. How much do you owe? Served 18 years. I'm on life parole. Life parole. Okay. Hey, Thaxter, you want to tell Rambo we're out for seven? Wait a couple minutes, huh? See the guy at the desk, the one with Bosberg? Yeah, he's an ex-con, Frank Cheney, 1931. Jack Taylor and I had him. First big one we ever drew. That's so. Did you ever hear of him? Used to call him a gentleman bandit? 1931, Claude. That's 18 years ago. Cheney was the biggest of them. Came from a wealthy family, too. Father's a millionaire. You sent him up, huh? Sent Quentin. Tried to break out with a partner. His partner killed a trustee. Cheney was sent to Folsom. From a millionaire family. That's a queer one. Yeah. Well, how about that lunch, fellas? Yeah, let's go. Seems like it could have been yesterday. 1931. We grow old right along with the thieves, huh? Where we go? Federal cafe? That's all right with me. 18 years. Yeah. Sure goes by in a hurry. I wonder if Cheney thinks so. As far as day-to-day routine goes, police work is pretty much like any other job. To the rookie detective just starting in, there's new things to see, new things to learn. But five or six years on the detail and the job gets pretty ordinary. You see a lot of dirt, a lot of trouble and tragedy, and after a while you begin to wonder what all the glamour's about and the excitement that's supposed to go along with the job. The fall months went by pretty slow. On November 3rd, we closed a case against a gang of drugstore hold-up men. In December, Ben's youngster fell off a fence and sprained his wrist. 
My Uncle George from Renton, Washington, visited my mother and me in January. Stayed a couple of weeks. On January 28th, it rained. Ben and I checked into the office where we got a phone call from Lieutenant Mort Gear of the San Diego Police Department. He gave us additional information on a finance company holdup which had been pulled in San Diego the day before. In the robbery, one bystander had been shot and killed and another one wounded by the two bandits. They also shot a police officer three times through the stomach when he tried to stop him. Next day, Sergeants Ormsby and McGuire from San Diego arrived and we helped them check the suspects through the stats office. A couple of bad ones, Joe. Both have guns and they use them. One of them got away in a car and the other one on foot. Is that right, McGuire? Yeah, a big one used the car. Yeah, size ought to help some. Let's see, 45 years old. Height, six foot one or two inches. Weight, 275 to 85 pounds. Anybody get a look at the car, Ormsby? Blue Ford sedan, 1940 or 41 model. That's all we got. Mm, it's a rough one. After all the shooting, the witnesses didn't know what they saw, all mixed up. Well, how about the other one, the guy who got away on foot? He's a WMA, about 50 years old, 5 feet 8, 9 inches, 145, 55 pounds, wears glasses. Yeah, we got that on the teletype, is that all? Uh, no, we traced from the Greyhound bus depot about six blocks from the holdup, changed his clothes in the washroom there, left behind a coat and a gun. Yeah. The coat was kind of give parolee some state pen. Mm -hmm. Checked it through our crime lab. Same kind of suits are issued to all ex-cons. No make. Well, at least you know one of them's an ex-con. How about that gun you found? It's the murder weapon. Our ballistics men went over it, no prints. Tried to trace the serial number, no record. CII in Sacramento is trying to run it down. Well, we got any hunches? A few. We're almost sure both of them have gone the route before. Pretty cool. Shot down three people, didn't bat an eye. How much did they take in the holder? 11,000. Hey, your stats office make a run those descriptions yet? Here this morning, Orin I's got the list of possibilities. They're pulling the mud cast now. I'll be winding it up right now, don't you think? Yeah, hey, let's check. Mm -hmm. This way, fellas. Yeah. Go ahead, Orin. Oh, thanks. How's the wife, Orin? Oh, fine, Ben. She's expecting again. What are you going to do, raise an army? Four kids? That's not so bad. McGuire's wife wants six. How about that, Mac? We've got five now. No point in quitting when you're ahead. <laughs> Frank? Yeah, Joe. You know Russ Ormsby and Tony McGuire, don't you? San Diego PD? Yeah, sure. I met him last trip. Hi. Hi, Russ, Hi Frank. Tony. Good to see you. Good. Just ready to call you. Got those mug shots together for you. Here, got them right here. Okay. There you are. Next for suspect one, this is for number two. Okay, Frank, we'll check them out with the witnesses. There's one mug there. Here, let me show you. Here, this one. Yeah. It matches the description pretty close. Safe man by trade, but he can go any route. Name's Weber. First name? Stanley. Mm -hmm. Call him Turk, I think, nickname. Know anything about it? He's next con. Ormsby and McGuire drove back to San Diego to show the mug shots to the holdup witnesses and see if they could get an identification. Late the next afternoon, they called back to tell us that Stanley Turk Weber had definitely been identified from his mug shot by four of the five witnesses as one of the holdup men. His partner remained unidentified. We called Turk Weber's parole officer, got all the available information on the suspect, including his latest address, an apartment house on North Alameda. Weber wasn't there. We talked with the apartment house manager, and he told us that Turk hadn't been seen there since the day before the San Diego robbery and murder. We had a stake output on the apartment. Ben and I went back to the office and had the record bureau pull Weber's package. On his mama sheet, Ben spotted a familiar name, Henry Garson, another ex-con who was listed as one of Turk Weber's closest friends. Well, we got a hold of Garson's parole officer. He told us Garson had had his parole transferred to San Diego, where he disappeared two weeks before he was wanted for violation of parole. We tried to check Weber through his relatives. We couldn't find any. But Henry Garson's report showed that he had a brother, Al, who ran a dry cleaning shop down in Seal Beach. He had no criminal record. The next morning, we drove down to see him. Yeah, Henry came around last July. It's the last time I saw him. I wanted to borrow my car. You got any idea where he might be now? No. You're his brother. I don't know where he is. That's the truth. I don't want to know where he is. Was anyone with him when he came to see you last? You know who his friends are? Friends? No. Would you look at these pictures, please, see if you can identify any of them? All right, just... No. These here. No. No. Ah. How about these? No. No. Oh, 
No, no, look, can't, can't you talk to me later? It's not good for business having cops around a shop. Who would you yell for if a shop was held up, Mr. Carson? What's that got to do with it? Your brother's in trouble. We might stop him from getting in deep. Now, look away now. Hello, Mrs. Renner. Good morning, Al. Can I help you? No, Russia. You're going to wait in the gentleman. No, no that's, that's all right. right. They're just waiting. Mm-hmm. Can I help you? My husband's still cleaned and pressed. Can you have back Tuesday? Tuesday, yeah, I'll My plaid jacket's being pressed. Yeah. Could you talk this little stairs here? Where? Yeah, yeah, we take care of that. Tuesday, all right. There you are. Thanks, Miss Runner. All right, yeah, bye. Bye, Miss Runner, thanks. I don't like to hold you up, Garson. Just a few more questions. All right. Now, you said the last time your brother was here, he wanted to borrow your car. Is that right? That's right. Did you let him have it? I let him have nothing. How about the rescue plan? Oh, can't you let us alone? If Henry's in trouble, let him take care of it. We've got troubles enough of our own. This is important, Garson. We've got to have your cooperation. Well, why me? No, Henry's no good. I admit it. He's still my brother. Yeah. You ask me to send him to jail? If he belongs there, yeah. Look, I don't want any trouble. Yeah, will be. My mother lives in Santa Barbara. Just moved there. I got the address. Henry goes to see her every once in a while. When's the last time he saw her? Two weeks ago. I was there, too. And something else. What's that? Henry had a gun. 11 a.m. Tuesday. Ben and I drove back to the office and put in a call to the Santa Barbara Police Department. We asked him to put a stake out on the home of Henry Garson's mother and to notify us the minute Garson was apprehended. We contacted San Diego and told him what we'd found out. After that, we doubled back on Turk Weber. From one of our informants, we heard that Weber and Garson had gone into some kind of a business together. For a bank roll, they'd succeeded in getting a loan from the Second National Bank out in Glendale. 1 p.m., we drove out and checked with the manager of the bank's loan department, Mr. Peabody. And here we are, officers. Stanley T. Weber, Henry Garson. Loan papers were signed over a month ago. What kind of a loan was it, Peabody? Business loan. Garson and Weber came in with another man. They talked to our manager, Mr. Ascot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. What business are they in? Trucking concern. They wanted the money to buy equipment for more trucks. How much money did they borrow? $4,500, usual terms. I guess you inquired into their background. Oh, yes, their whole financial background. Did you know that Garson and Weber are both ex-convicts? I beg your pardon? I said, did you know that both of them are ex-convicts? You sure you haven't made a mistake? Henry Garson, Stanley T. Weber? Yeah, that's right. What'd they offer for collateral? Well, they had some of their equipment, two trucks, and then, of course, there was the cosigner. Who was that? The name's right here on the loan papers. Let's see. Right here, cosigner Frank Cheney. p.m. Ben and I checked back into the office and went down the hall to R&I. We pulled a package on Frank Bertram Cheney. White male American, 5'8 inches, 152 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. The record read like a dime novel. Almost 20 years before, Cheney had crashed into the headlines of Pacific Coast newspapers as the gentleman bandit. Maybe some of the news stories were exaggerated, but the record showed that he actually owned a yacht, three expensive cars, an apartment house. In spite of all this, he had decided to settle for a career of robbery and murder. At the age of 30, he was the most sought-after man on the Pacific Coast. Finally, in 1931, after tracking him for a year and a half through more than a dozen armed robberies, Sergeants Thaxter and Taylor of the Los Angeles Police Department brought him in. He served 18 years at San Quentin in Folsom Penitentiaries, and then he won his parole at the age of 48. We checked his parole officer, and he had nothing to report against him. We checked back in at robbery detail and met with Captain Ed Walker. How about Cheney's friends, Weber and Garson? Nothing yet? Not a thing, Skipper. Stakeout's still on at Garson's mother's place in Santa Barbara. Weber's apartment's still covered. You called San Diego about this, the Cheney angle? Yeah, we briefed him. They got all the mug shots down there. Weber's definitely been tagged as one of the men on that finance company job. I figured Garson for the second man, but none of the witnesses have picked out his mug shot. You talked to Cheney's parole officer, huh? Yeah, I did. He gave us Cheney's last address. Same as the one on his ex-con registration, but he's moved. Didn't notify the officer. What does that leave you? Well, I talked to the manager at the apartment. He gave us a couple of addresses to run down. Guess we better start getting on it, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's getting late. Keep in touch. I'll notify if anything breaks here. Right. Just a minute. Robbery, Walker. Well? Yeah, just a minute. You, Joe. Thank you. San Diego. Thanks. Friday. McGuire, Joe. How you doing? Good. You got something? We had the holdup witnesses back in again this afternoon. Showed them more mug shots. Yeah. Picked out Weber's partner in the holdup. Yeah? Name's Frank Cheney. You are 
are listening to Dragnet, the case history of a police investigation presented in the public interest by Fatima Cigarettes. Tuesday, January 31st, 4 p.m. In addition to the San Diego teletype, we got out a local broadcast and an APB on Frank Cheney. By 4.30, Ben and I had checked out the first of two addresses where Cheney's former landlady told us that he might be staying. It was a rooming house out in West Washington. The owner told us that Cheney had stayed at his place for a few days, but that had been more than two months before. He had no idea where the suspect might be. We then drove to the second address. It was an apartment house on West Stanford near Slauson. The manager's name was Mrs. Pritchard. Why, yes, I believe Mr. and Mrs. Cheney are home. They've been in all day. Which apartment is they in, ma'am? Number seven, straight down the hall on your right. Thank you. They uh, may be having dinner now. Are they expecting you? Be all right, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. How about the door? apartment was deserted. We checked the bedroom and the kitchen. There were obvious signs of a fast getaway. On a card table in the living room, we found the remains of a quick dinner. Two places were set. One plate was almost clean, the other hardly touched. The coffee on the stove was still lukewarm. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout. Then we went back down the hall and talked to the manager again. Well, they moved in about a month ago, Sergeant. They looked like any other newly married couple. Did you notice if they had any visitors, Mrs. Bridger? Well, they might have, but I didn't notice. Did you notice anything odd about them at all? Mm, only that one thing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Cheney always seemed to have plenty of money. Put down two months rent in advance. But he didn't seem to have a job. Yes, ma'am. Well, every morning he'd sleep late, but his wife was up at 8 o'clock to go to work. Where'd she work, you know? Well, a company called Thompson and some other name. Offices are down on South Hope, uh, Builders, I think. Homes and mm-hmm. my phone. Would you excuse me? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Hello? Oh, yes. What? Yes, two police officers. Miss Pritchard, no. To talk to you. Well, hello? Cheney? Oh, well, yes, he hung up. An alert for Cheney and his wife was broadcast with special attention for the south end of the city. The wife's name and description was added to the APB. The next morning, Ben and I located her place of employment, Thompson and Kilkenny, a big construction company. The office manager told us that three days before, Mrs. Cheney had resigned her job by letter. She asked that her final paycheck be sent to her mother, who lived in Marysville, California. We contacted the Marysville Police Department immediately, and the home of Cheney's mother-in-law was placed under 24-hour surveillance. We now had more than a half a dozen stakeouts going. A week passed. Nothing. Cheney and his wife seemed to have dropped completely from sight. Wednesday, February 9th, we got a tip from the Santa Barbara police that Cheney's friend, Henry Garson, was in Los Angeles working in an auction house on Wilshire Boulevard. We ran it down. Looks like a high-class place. They got a nice crowd, haven't they? Mm -hmm. You can't lock here? No, thanks. We'd like to see the manager, please. All right. Let me see. Oh, yes, over there by the claim desk. Uh, the man in the dark suit, Mr. Woolley. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Woolley? Yeah? Police officer, sir. We'd like to check on a man who's supposed to be one of your employees, sir. Oh, that's so? What's his name? Um, here's his picture. Can you identify? Why, yes, that's Johnson, the new clerk. You want to talk to him? Yes, sir. All right. Right this way. He's back in the storeroom. Some kind of trouble? We'd like to talk to him. Yes, all right. Let's see. Oh, yes, there he is. Uh, Johnson. Oh, Johnson, would you come... Come on, Ben. What are you running for? Johnson, come here. Out the back. Yeah. There he goes. He's heading up the street. Come on. Yeah. He got on that bus. All right, come on. Let's double back to the car. Yeah. Hurry. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, move it. 
that did it. The driver's pulling over. Pull up behind the bus there, huh? Come on, let's go. You cover the back door, will you? Open your door. What's the matter? The police officers want to check your passengers. Open that rear door right yes, away. Yes, sir. All right, Garson, get off. I'm getting off. Coming at you, Joe. Getting off, cop. I'll make a hole. Drop it, Garson. He's got a gun. I said I'm getting off. All right, you let's drop it. Come on. Good, Joe. You okay? Yeah. Let's get him off again. Hey, what's it all about? He do something wrong? Yeah, he didn't get off when we asked him to. Nine p.m. Wednesday, we drove Garson to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where he was treated for minor cuts and bruises. Then we took him back to the office of the interrogation room. We called San Diego and notified them of the arrest. From ten o'clock that night until ten the next morning. Captain Walker, Ben, and I questioned Garson. He refused to admit that he even knew Frank Cheney or Turk Weber. By noon, he was pretty tired. So were we. At 12.05, a call came through from San Diego. Oh, Friday, this is Russ Ormsby. Yeah, Russ. Fresh lead on Turk Weber. Uh, he's got a sister living in San Clemente. Yeah? And we've got our house staked out. Had a tip he's going to pay her a visit. When's that? This afternoon. <laughs> 3.15 p.m. We got to the San Clemente turnoff, and a few minutes later, Ormsby and McGuire arrived from San Diego. We drove to the home of Weber's sister on South Orange Street and identified ourselves. She told us that Turk had been there that morning, but that he'd gone to the races at Del Mar for the afternoon. Did your brother say he was coming back? Said he might be back. He wasn't sure. Did he go to the racetrack alone? Yeah. Was he going to meet anyone there? I don't think so. He didn't mention it. You driving a car? No, he took the bus to the track. I see. Where would he most likely go if he doesn't come back here? I don't know. Maybe back to L.A., maybe San Diego. I don't know. Well, do you know if your brother Turk is going to meet Frank Cheney? How could he? Turk says Cheney's up north someplace with his wife. He told me that this morning. Where up north? He didn't know. Mm-hmm. You and McGuire want to stake out here, Ormsby? Ben and I will hit the track. Yeah, okay. Look, I can't have cops here if Turk comes back. I think I framed him. You can get over it. You don't know Turk when he gets sore. He goes out of his head. He'll kill me. Why worry, miss? Huh? He'll have to kill us first. Three forty-five p.m. Ben and I left Weber's sister's house and drove down to the racetrack at Del Mar. We got there just at the start of the seventh race. We had no idea whether the suspect was still there or not. We alerted the security police, gave them mug shots of Weber. Then we went to the public address booth in the clubhouse and talked to the man in charge. A few minutes later, the trap for Weber was set. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address booth. Emergency phone call. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address booth. We waited. Ben stationed at a vantage point on one side of the booth, me on the other. Minutes passed. Weber didn't show. Ben caught my eye and shrugged his shoulders. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address booth with emergency telephone call. Mr. Stanley T. Weber, please come to the public address booth. The announcer was barely finished when I saw Ben motioning. I looked and saw a large man heading up the cement ramp. When he got to the top, he turned to his right and headed straight for the public address booth. It was Turk Weber. Hold it right there, Weber. Uh, Police officers, get your hands up. What is this? You lousy cops, I'll have you busted for this. David Weber, get your hands up. Who tipped you? What difference does it make sense to him? You'll never get him. You'll never get him in 20 years. Never get who? You know who, Cheney. He's too smart for you. You'll never get him not in 20 All years. All right, we got you, Weber. Shake him, Ben. I'll shake you, copper. Watch it, Ben. Let go. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. All right, sir. That's it. Sure, a big package. Yeah. What's that over there? Did that fall out of his pocket? Hmm. Like a tip sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Blue Boy's Peerless Selection for Thursday. Price one dollar. Let me look at him in a minute, can I? Mm. Mm. Best picks. You can't lose. This is your lucky day. What's it prove? He ought to get his dollar back. 
The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 19th, trial was held in Superior Court, city and county of San Diego, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. After identifying Frank Cheney as the man who did the shooting in the San Diego holdup and murder, Stanley T. Weber was tried and convicted of participation in the robbery and received a sentence of life imprisonment. Henry Garson was cleared of any complicity in the holdup killing, but he was returned to prison for violation of parole and for several burglaries in San Diego and Los Angeles. Both men are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. Next week, Frank Cheney, the Gentleman Bandit, Part 2. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Sarah's Private Caper with comedian Sarah Berner on NBC. That was The Gentleman Bandit Part 1, a.k.a. The Big Gent, on the Dragnet Radio Podcast from July 20th, 1950, here on Radio Retropolis. It seems like Friday and Romero got to their car pretty quickly after Garson tried to make a getaway by getting on the bus, didn't they? Seems like they ran right out, got to the car, in quick, followed the bus, nailed them all within 45 seconds. But I do love Friday's last line when asked what Garson did wrong. The answer? He didn't get off the bus when we asked him to. (laughs) We'll have part two next time as we find out what happens with Frank Cheney. And also there'll be something new for Joe Friday that puts him a little out of his comfort zone. You're going to love it. But right now, I want to do something a little special for you. I'd like to share a series of moments from an interview I did with a man named Bill Roddy, who himself was a radio legend in San Francisco from 1942 to 1965, and one who actually housed and befriended a very young Jack Webb before Dragnet and all the movies made him famous. Over the course of the next four podcasts, I'd like to share segments of this conversation with you. Here's part one with Bill Roddy as he tells us how he got his start in radio and meeting Jack Webb. Well, my mother and father were both in show business, but by 1942, I was more interested in radio. I had a friend who was a page boy at Radio City, San Francisco, which was the studio headquarters for ABC and NBC, and I, the manager hired me as a page boy, And I was a page boy until 1943, and then I was hired as a junior announcer, and uh, I stayed in that until I went in the Merchant Marine as a radio operator in the Merchant Marine and shipped all around the world during World War II. Then after the war, I came back and I became an announcer at NBC San Francisco, And that's how I met uh, Jack Webb. He told me he needed a place to live. And I said, well, my mother has a rooming house on (laughs) Fulton Street in San Francisco. So he went out there and he liked a room and he rented a room for my mother. And uh, every morning we got up at the same time and went to Foster's Cafeteria and had breakfast and then went on to NBC and ABC. He opened ABC and I opened NBC. Uh, What was radio like back in those early days in San Francisco? Well, 
NBC, uh, San Francisco, New York, I mean, Los Angeles didn't have the programs. They were all out of San Francisco. The big shows were out of San Francisco, Standard Oil Company Hour, you know, things like that. And um, and so it was more, San Francisco was more of a headquarters than Los Angeles. And then when NBC bought uh, a station in Los Angeles, they transferred all the stuff out of San Francisco. So they left us without any big, big shows. Was it an exciting time? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we had an audience shows for things like the Standard Oil Company and things like that. And, but after NBC opened Los Angeles, it changed a lot. And then I stayed there until 1944, 43, when I uh, was either drafted or went in the service, and I chose to go in the Merchant Marine, and I was a radio operator on merchant ships and uh, went to places like Saipan, Guadalcanal, Ulithi, things like that. And then after the war, I came back to San Francisco and uh, got, got a job at NBC. Did you work strictly in news as a news announcer or were you... Gen general. General. Yeah, I could work for radio broadcasting, news, things like that. And uh, then uh, I went, went back, I was in the Merchant Marine, and I wound up in uh, New York on a ship. And I went to NBC and found out they needed uh, a junior announcer. So I left my ship and I went to work at NBC New York. But after the summer season, they didn't need me anymore. And I went back in the Merchant Marine and I sailed around the world again. And then I went back to San Francisco and uh, started as a news correspondent. And I did a lot of uh, news corresponding work. My mother was in a uh, bus accident. That was big. Right. Because one of the people at NBC San Francisco said, isn't this your mother? My mother, my, fa my uncle, and my aunt all were in a bus accident in San Francisco. And... Uh, my mother's in the hospital for quite some time, and afterwards, she and my aunt bought the rooming house on Fulton Street, and that's how I met Jack Webb. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's how you met Jack Webb? Yeah. You didn't know him at I all didn't, before I that. didn't know him before. He, uh, he opened NBC, separate, ABC. I opened NBC. He told me he needed a place to live. I said, my mother has a rooming house. So he went out there, and he liked it, and he got a room there. And Julie London used to come up and see him. Now, what did you, first of all, what did you think of Jack Webb when you first met him? I didn't think of him any more than another announcer, newscaster, you know, like that. What, did you, were you instant friends with him or was oh, yeah. it just as professional? Yeah, we are friends yeah. because, uh, you know, we both worked in the same building. We both had breakfast at Foster's Cafeteria, right. you know. What did you like about him? That's what I, what I like what about him. What did you like about him? Uh, I I don't know, just like uh, a friend, you know. I there was nothing special. Yeah, but we used to have a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, my mother at a rooming house uh, would have parties there. We had a big, big dining room, living room in the building, and everybody from Radio City would come out there. We'd have big parties, you know. Bill Roddy passed away just a couple of months after this interview at the age of 94. I'm grateful that not only did I get to meet and talk with this man, but that his words were documented right here for you, for a new generation to know. Bill Roddy was an important part of our radio history. In our next Dragnet podcast, we'll talk even more with Bill and one of his most famous incidents as a radio correspondent. That was... The Gentleman Bandit Part 1, also known as The Big Gent, from July 20th, 1950, here on Radio Retropolis. This is Radio Retropolis.